The World Economic Forum says it will take almost 170 years to close a global economic gender gap. That gap between women and men in the workforce, pay and leadership is estimated to be costing the world about $12 trillion in gross domestic product. IMF research shows that closing the gender gap could increase GDP by a whopping average 35%, 80% of those gains would come from women joining the labor force, but the other 20% is because women bring different skills and perspectives to the workplace, helping to increase productivity. For more on the work that still needs to be done to bring about gender parity, let's bring in Katika Roy. She's an award-winning gender economist and CEO of tech company Pipeline. Katika, thanks so much for coming on. We're so happy to have you. You say that inflation isn't gender neutral, and that women still habitually suffer from pent-up in inequity. One area that is clearly evident is when it comes to home buying and access to fair mortgage rates, obviously higher thanks to current Fed policies tied to inflation. Why is it harder to get equitable mortgages for women and minority women? Bank lenders are one obstacle. Yes, absolutely. So thanks for having me on. You know, one of the things that we see is that in Inflation actually isn't gender neutral. So for consumer products that are targeted toward women versus men, they actually have twice the inflation rate. Specific to mortgages, one of the things that we know is that women are viewed as a bigger credit risk uh, and their credit worthiness is lower when banks look at them. I, a lot of that has to do with the algorithms and decision-making tools that mortgage lenders uh, use which often don't take gender into account. They are call, often called gender blind, uh, which actually hinders women from being able uh, to attain mortgages and, and, and good mortgage rates. And on average, they will actually pay higher mortgage rates than men. And Kadiga, your position is there is a more equitable solution than the Fed's policy of hiking rates to cool the economy, which you say hurts women. Yes. So one of the things, so if we take a step back, we know, for instance, that the Fed has a dual mandate. Their dual mandate is price stability and full employment. We know right now inflation is running about one percentage point above the Fed's target inflation rate, and unemployment is about uh, 0.5 percentage points lower. The way that you control inflation or a key way that you can control inflation is to increase the labor force. And one of the key ways that we do that in the United States is with women. Since the beginning of the pandemic, we have 300,000 women still missing from the labor force since the beginning of the pandemic. And if you look at that more broadly, uh, we actually have a 2.4 million person gap between the number of jobs that are open in the United States and the number of people looking for jobs. It's about 1.4 jobs open for every one person looking for a job. And if we brought those 300,000 women back, we could actually close that gap by 12%. So that's not only an issue of fairness or the right thing to do, it's actually a huge economic opportunity. Since 1970, women have actually added $2 trillion to the U.S. economy through their increased labor force participation. It seems so obvious the way you put it. So why aren't more strides being made? Because we don't look at the data through the lens of gender and gender plus race and ethnicity. If you just look at the last jobs report on March 8, for instance, you'll see that we had a really low uh, unemployment rate. But if you actually look at it through the lens of gender plus race and ethnicity, so specifically for black women and Latinas, they're actually, they're, their unemployment rate, so 5% and 6%, when you control for uh, population growth and historic labor force participation, is actually above the Fed's target unemployment rate. So we need to be looking at this data more specifically through the lens of gender plus race and ethnicity. And that way we can actually have policies that bring more women back into the labor force. And staying on black women for a second, because there is so much inequity there. When it comes to even home ownership, a new survey says black women are outpacing black men now. 27% of black home buyers are actually single females, according to the data, but yet barriers do remain. Things like low paying jobs, student loan debt, minority women typically carry more debt. How should they overcome this? How do they overcome this? 
What we need to do is actually uh, shift the responsibility for overcoming it from black women to the systems that judge and 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 uh, serve for their access to things like credit, right? That that's what we we actually need to do. So just if you look at student loans, for instance, uh, black women had the second lowest return rate of return in terms of their increase in wages on uh, on going to college. And yet they are um, one of the largest holders of student loan debt. And that, that actually ties back to the pay gap. And so what we need to do is look at these, uh, these pieces together to actually ensure that black women are getting an equitable return on their investment in higher education, that they're not having to take out more student loans because they have a bigger pay gap, and that they're actually earning more on the back end. Kartika, when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, there was a huge she session in this country. Now that is over, but women's employment hasn't fully recovered. Why is that and how do we increase female labor participation? Yeah, so as I mentioned, we have still have 300,000 women missing from the beginning uh, of the pandemic. So we still have this opportunity to increase labor force participation. There's really two key ways that we can increase women's labor force participation. One is by using tech tools such as Pipeline that really shift our systems from inequitable by default to equitable by design. Let me just give you a quick example of what that means. Women are 58% of college graduates, 47% of the labor base, and yet they're only 10% of Fortune 500 CEOs, and that's actually a record high. So you have about a 37 percentage point gap between women in the labor force and Fortune 500 CEOs. So what we need to do is actually shift those people decisions, so things like performance and potential, who, uh, who gets access to visibility. Uh, vis high visibility um, assignments as well as their pay to equitable by design. And we would actually catalyze uh, our time toward gender equity. You know, let's hope it doesn't take, as the World Economic Forum says, 170 years to close that pay gap. We're out of time, but Kanta Garoy, thank you so much for your insight. Thank you.